Hey there, Tim G5TM back for another video and thanks for joining me. Now over the next couple of weeks I'll be releasing maybe three or four videos looking at efficiency in terms of HF mobile setups. Now you might have seen one or two of my videos. I really enjoy operating HF mobile. So um, I've been looking into this in a lot of detail and come up with a lot of information from about three or four, maybe five different sources who have proven to be very influential in terms of the amount of stuff they produced. So we're going to look today at the, the importance of the literally the size, the length of the HF mobile whip that you would use when you go in HF mobile according to the different uh, sort of bands that you would use basically. So before we start, I put a few things together, but I'd like to acknowledge first of all uh, some of the uh, stuff that one or two people have done. In this case, for this presentation, uh, the work of WHJI, K0BG and WA5VJB. And it's thanks to uh, it's thanks to their work really that we've got such a wealth of information that we can draw on in terms of operating uh, HF uh, HF mobile. Really, really some great work that they've done. So uh, when we're looking at operating HF mobile, and what are the challenges? Well, arguably the main challenges of operating HF mobile depends on the bands that you're on. So if you're up on 30 meters and above, certainly 20 meters and above anyway, then propagation is probably your biggest. Uh, biggest factor which determines whether or not you're going to have a successful operation or not. Once you get down to 40 metres then antenna size uh, restrictions come into play and certainly uh, when you get down to sort of 180, sorry, 160 to 80 metres then clearly having a, uh, a short whip antenna is a, is a, can be a huge disadvantage. Now when we're looking at efficiency therefore it's comprised mainly of radiation resistance but also as we'll see in fact we'll deal with this in uh, sort of later videos we'll be looking at the other factors on that screen there as well uh, namely ground losses and loading coil losses as well but for today we're going to look at the importance of radiation resistance now we need this uh, to be as high as we possibly can now, WHJI, I should say, has come up with some really interesting stuff. And he's argued, I think very plausibly indeed, that there are some, quite frankly, some unavoidable truths when it comes to using small antennas. There aren't any simple or easy measures to make a small antenna act exactly like a large antenna. So, um, by the way, when we're looking at what we mean by a small antenna here, we're looking at any antenna which is less than a quarter wave, or in many cases, substantially less than a quarter wave. So to radiate antennas need current to move directly in a line across a physical space. And small sized antennas have to be provided with a lot of assistance to become highly efficient antennas. And some of the, the key points that WHAI makes is, I think, very important. We need to make the antenna that we operate in as large and in a straight line as we can. We try to avoid folding or bending at uh, high current areas of the antenna. Um, as we'll see in a moment, we can use end loading to create capacitance at the antenna ends to make sure the current is as uniform as possible over the length of the antenna. And that point that Tom WHJI makes about the antenna, sorry, the current needing to be as uniform as possible across the antenna is a critical thing when it comes to radiation resistance. We'll have a look at that in a second. If we're going to use loading coils, loading coils, as you say, which we'll look at in a in a future video, we need to make their design as low loss as possible and we need to keep high current areas of the antenna away from other large and lossy conductors. So what then is the definition of radiation radiation resistance? The top um, in, in bold there seems to be the one that I would want to use. It's the total power radiated in all directions divided by the square of the effective current causing the radiation. Now Previously, and I think the vast majority of amateurs do this, we tend to sort of look closely at the antenna's feed point impedance. Um, and this can sometimes produce different results when it comes to looking at radiation resistance. And what WHJI argues, in fact, is that this is, in fact, measures the antenna feed point resistance not the real radiation resistance. So there is a formula. All we need got, all we got to be wary about, be aware about here, 
and this is the formula that WHJI backs as well from the IRE, is the fact that the two biggest determinants of how efficiently our, our antenna radiates in terms of the radiation resistance anyway, is the antenna length and its, uh, its percentage of the wavelength that the antenna is on. So effectively, we need to make our antenna as long as we physically possibly can um, and that in itself will determine its efficiency on the band or bands you want it to operate on. It is really and truly as simple as that. So if we look, we've got two different types of um, diagram there, uh, contrasting diagrams, if you may. Now, on the left-hand side, we've got what Tom WHJI uh, determines to be a smooth sign shape decrease of current. And it, we are looking at a dipole here, but the same pattern exists according to verticals as well. So on the left, you've got a full-size dipole. Now, what we mean by full-size, of course, is a half wave, okay? So uh, imagine, therefore, we have got a dipole, uh, which, uh, in effect, is a half wavelength long for, say, 20 meters, 10 meters long, all right? It happens to be center-fed, okay? Now, looking back at the diagram, therefore, we have... Uh, a maximum current to allow 100 watts to be radiated, say we're putting 100 watts into this antenna, we need to, or we'll see a maximum current in the center there of about 1.2 amps. Now on the right-hand side, we've got what Tom determines to be a triangular straight line current. You can see it's a, it's a slightly different looking shape to what we got in the middle, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, we've got a smooth sign shape decrease of current. On the right, we've got more of a triangular straight line current. And the current is much higher for the same power, what, um, what uh, Tom determines to be the ampere per feet to radiate a given power. So this dipole on the right is an eighth wavelength long. All right, it's really short. Um, and because of that, we've got more of a triangular current distribution. So rather than only needing to have 1.2 amps to radiate 100 watts, we're now going up to 9.5 amps. And what this means, therefore, is that we have a very much a reduction in radiation resistance. Now, what we can do, of course, and this happens with dipoles and verticals, is that we can end load the antenna. And what then happens is that you have a slightly smoother current distribution, as you can see in the right-hand side. You can see that dipole has now got hats at the ends, basically wires at the ends, and that allows the current to become more uniform we now have a reduction in the amount of current we need to radiate 100 watts compared with that much shorter vertical. So that, that di sorry, dipole, I should say, that dipole is still one-eighth wavelength long, but we've now got end loading, which means that the current becomes more uniform. And what's striking is that on the left-hand side, we can see uh, what Tom says to be the result of that. So if we top load verticals or end load dipoles, that causes current distribution to be uniform and increases radiation resistance by four times. Effectively, therefore, as Tom says there, it's like doubling the length of the antenna. Now, that's quite striking, isn't it? And you've seen, as we've seen in a minute, we can see uh, pictures of people using capacitance hats and end loading dipoles and verticals. And now we know why they do it, because in the uh, in, in electrical sense, you've actually doubled the length of that antenna, which can make quite a bit of difference to the performance of the antenna. And end loading is the most efficient way of creating that extra uh, sort of, um, well, electrical length to that particular antenna. So um, this is an example of how you can do it. Look, we've got a typical very short antenna on the right-hand side. that happens to be a tar heel screwdriver antenna. Um, we've got a three-foot, literally a three-foot rod coming from that antenna. But then you've got the capacity hats at the top. So basically what you've then got is equivalent to a six-foot whip, which will increase its uh, efficiency, especially on 40 metres, as I thought. So that's a pretty, a pretty decent way of doing it. Now, if we double the length of the antenna like that, then what we're then doing is effectively quadrupling the radiation resistance so our you know well we've effectively then if we, our antenna is only one sixteenth of a wavelength long that's a you know one sixth the size of the wavelength um uh, one sixteenth the size of the wavelength i should say about six percent the size of the wavelength then we've only got radiation resistance of about six ohms but if we then uh, add end loading 
or if you actually manage to physically double the length of the antenna, then suddenly you're turning out one sixteenth of a wavelength vertical into a one eighth, and suddenly you then got about 24.7 ohms. And if you start off with a one eighth wavelength antenna at 24.7 ohms, then suddenly you're quadrupling it again to a radiation resistance of just under 100 ohms. So what we're going to look at now is an example of what difference that actually makes to our antenna. So uh, what we've got here, look, if you look at the, the screen here, we've got a, a straight short vertical without any loading, just a normal straight vertical. Now it says it's 10 degrees long. That's 10 out of 360 as a wavelength. What well, all that means is for 40 meters, this vertical is just under four foot long. It's three point, say three foot eight inches long, which is about 1.1, just over 1.1 meters long. So as you can appreciate, a very, uh, very short vertical indeed. We're looking at 40 meters as an example, the 40 meter band here. So we're operating a an antenna isn't even four foot long or just over 1.1 meters long on 40 meters. So um, if we then use that formula to calculate the radiation resistance, we've got a radiation resistance of just 1.2 ohms. But the problem is, because it's such a short ante antenna, way below a quarter wave, uh, we would still have that straight triangular current pattern we looked at before. So actually that 1.2 ohms can be reduced by a factor of four and we now only have 0.3 ohms as our radiation resistance. As you can see here, look, so at the top, you've got the radiation resistance of 0.3. At the bottom, that means that our 100 watts that we might pump into this antenna, we're squirting out just over 3 watts. So uh, effectively, therefore, this antenna has an efficiency of about 3%. So you can imagine putting uh, 10 watts, if you've, got, if you've got a 10 watt license, then you'd be putting out about 0.3 watts. All right, so that's quite a, a striking example, really. Now, if we go back to this and see how we can improve this, well, if we add capacity hat loading, then we can smooth out the current to become closer to uniform across the antenna. And that, for, that therefore, brings the radiation resistance back up by a factor of four, and our efficiency actually goes up from 3% to 11%. So we've effectively added just shy of 6 dB to the increase in the radiating power. So that is why you see some of these guys with big screwdriver antennas with capacity hats, pastons hats on the top, because what they're wanting to do, what they are actually being able to do, is to electrically double the length of that antenna. And in doing so, you're quadrupling your efficiency and adding 6 dB to the performance of that antenna which effectively can't be a bad thing, uh, especially, when you're on, uh, especially when you're on 40 meters. Now, the capacity hats need to be installed properly. Now, K0BG, who's quite a guru in terms of um, mobile installations, he says a cap hat must be positioned at the very top of the antenna. And if you put it right above, say, a base loading coil, for example, right near the bottom of the antenna, you'll increase your bandwidth, but it will largely reduce your efficiency. So for these things to work well, you need to be at the top of the antenna. Uh, what he's also spoken about as well is the design of the antenna. Now, if you look on the left-hand picture, we saw that just now as an example of how we can add capacity hats. Um, but that spoke design on the left, he argues, isn't as um, efficient as the cloverleaf design on the right, which can be also be a very handy perch for birds. But uh, that, in effect, uh, the, the cloverleaf design on the right um, basically increases the uh, the diameter of the capacitance hat, which in turn increases efficiency, but of course it also increases wind load as well. Finally, WA5VJB, uh, in a very good article in QST magazine back in 1987, he also argues the length of the radiator matters. Now, what he did here, he uh, set up a quarter wave, for each of those three bands, uh, 75 meters, which is just above our 80 meter band in the UK, down about 3.8 to 3.9 megahertz, 40 meters and 20 meters. And that table on the on the left shows that what he's done effectively, he took the uh, the signal strength created from the uh, the quarter wave, said that's naught dB, that's his reference, and then compared it with the performance of a three foot through to 10 foot vertical 
I increased it by a matter of one foot at a time, look on the left hand side, and then looked at the signal strength that each of those antennas produced compared to a full size quarter wave on each band. Now if you notice, once we get to about 10 foot long, then on 75 meters is about 2s points down, minus 11 dB. On 40 meters, once we get to above 7 to 8 feet, we're about an s point away. But on 20 meters, one interesting thing is that once we get to about 8 foot long look, there isn't really much else to be gained until we get up to near a quarter, uh, quarter wave. So uh, effectively, therefore, it seems to be on that point that once you get the antenna up to being at least an eighth wave long, which it would be as an 8 foot antenna on 20 meters, then you would basically not see a huge difference from then, from then upwards. Uh, so he seems to suggest then that once you get an antenna up to be about an eighth wave long, you're going to be around a two to two and a half dB down compared to a quarter wave, which really in the real world isn't, uh, isn't that much of a big deal, quite frankly. But that's interesting information. So uh, next time, we're going to look then at uh, loading coils. We're going to look at base loading and center loading, the differences between them. We're going to look as well at a real life uh, difference between uh, two manufactured mobile antennas, one of which is from the same manufacturer, one of which is center loaded, one of which is base loaded. We're going to answer the question, to what extent is being a center loaded antenna uh, well, how much is that a big determinant of an improvement or is it simply because the antenna is longer? So we're going to look at the importance of base loading, center loading and how much center loading actually does increase your performance. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen, then click subscribe. There'll be a little thing up there somewhere, up there or up there. And there'll be another one over there somewhere for you to click on to, have a, to watch another video. Take care. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you for another one. 7-3 from G5TM. All the best.